In times of change and uncertainty, I always find myself turning towards some form of nostalgic entertainment. Whether it's a show or a movie that I can practically quote the entirety of, or a game that I've beaten hundreds of times already, there's just something about going back to a simpler time in life that makes the world feel a little less overwhelming. In these last two years, life has thrown a lot at me. And most of it's been good, thankfully. However, I learned that even change for the better can be mentally exhausting in its own way. Without going into every single detail, I'll give you the short answer of what's been happening. I had to grow up. Not that I hadn't already been doing that, I mean, that's just a part of being human. I'm talking about growing up as in having the sudden realization of, oh shit, this isn't working anymore, I need to get my act together. And in the process of getting my act together, I had a lot of time to reflect on, well, everything. And when it came to this YouTube channel, I remember the first video that I ever made, revisiting Rugrats as an adult. It's kind of poetic in hindsight that in my channel's infancy, I chose to analyze the show that's about literal infants. But Rugrats is one of those shows that I watch to feel like a kid again. And it does a damn good job of doing it, through the masterful way that it captures childlike wonder, along with juxtaposing it to the mundane aspects of adult life. But I already spent my time with that series. This channel is 10 years old now. In internet years, anyway. And it's time for me to make a video that accurately reflects the newfound maturity of my channel. It's time to grow up. All Grown Up was the sequel series to Rugrats, fast forwarding the babies into the preteen years of their lives. And it was. Uh, fine. It was fine. I'm sorry to anyone that clicked on this video assuming that it would be more focused on praising All Grown Up, but this ain't it, Chief. But before you hit dislike and write some less than friendly things in the comment section below, allow me to start off by saying that All Grown Up was actually a very important series to me as a kid. Not as much as its predecessor per se, but I still spent a considerable amount of time watching it. As a result of my nostalgia for it, a lot of mixed feelings came up when I found in my rewatch that it was not as good as I once remembered. And don't get me wrong here, it's not the worst thing that I've ever watched in my life, it's not even the worst sequel series or spin-off to come out of Nick. We all know which one is the worst. But I don't think I can understate how disappointing I found all grown up to be upon revisiting. And you know, maybe that's my own fault for expecting too much from an early 2000s children's cartoon. Oh my god, that sounds so much sadder when I say it out loud instead of just reading it. But I'll say now that my goal here isn't to trash All Grown Up. I always aim to be productive with what I have to say on this channel, so if I have criticism to give, I want it to have purpose. This show did mean a lot to me at one point in my life, and I certainly don't believe that I would have been better off not having watched it at all. However, I can't help but believe now that the only reason that people cared about this show to begin with, myself included, is because of its attachment to the Rugrats franchise. While it was a series that allowed us to see some of Nickelodeon's most iconic characters in a new era of their life, it ultimately failed in delivering a final product that possessed anything close to the qualities that made Rugrats as successful as it was. To save you the time of going back to watch my Rugrats video, and also because I'd prefer you just don't watch it, what I believe fueled the success of Rugrats was how it managed to take the mundanity of the real world that adults experience and fuse it together with a sense of imagination that only a baby could possess. A simple misunderstanding of what the parents would say or confusion about where they were taking the babies would result in these seemingly grand adventures all within the confines of a rather uninteresting or typical location. Not only that, but given that this was an episodic series that for the most part didn't really have much of an ongoing plot, we did however possess clear understandings of almost all of the characters in the show. Okay, well, maybe not Howard. I mean, he was so irrelevant that they just decided to canonize the fan theory that Betty was gay the entire time and not include him in the reboot. Which is extremely funny, yet also kinda sad to me. My point here is that Rugrats had a lot going for it. If I had to boil down the feel of this show to one word, I think that imaginative would definitely be the most accurate. But when it comes to All Grown Up, I feel as though its ultimate descriptor is unfortunately cynicism. At the time of All Grown Up's airing, I was in the perfect target demographic, which was being just slightly younger than the aged up versions of the cast. And as a result of that, it was very easy for me to project myself onto these characters and grow more and more excited for my own tween age independence. Or whatever the hell that actually means. Like I wanted nothing more than to be like Tommy and become a filmmaker myself. But now here I am making video essays on YouTube. So how did that dream pan out? 
but now that my preteen years are more than well behind me, returning to the series as an adult who was pleasantly surprised at how its predecessor has stood the test of time, I was shocked at how average All Grown Up is. My rose-colored glasses have been taken off, and now all I can really think about is why did this show need to exist in the first place? <laughs> all Grown Up, coming in November on Nickelodeon. Growing up changes everything. To answer that question, we actually have to go back to July 21st, 2001, or I suppose even a year before that. The hype surrounding All Grown Up first began when the 10th anniversary of Rugrats was on the horizon, and as a way to celebrate this significant milestone, we were treated to a one-hour special called All Growed Up. This special flashed our characters forward 10 years into the future, and it was bound to succeed from the concept alone. A time skip for one of the most iconic casts of characters in animation history couldn't be anything but exciting to viewers. Time skips are typically utilized in either one of two ways as epilogues to stories that have just concluded, showing us a happy future for our characters, or as a method of quickly advancing the story or world to a different point that opens up newer writing possibilities. Animated stories thankfully have the luxury of being able to pull off time skips a lot more believably, as the actors are usually able to retain their roles after their character's sudden shift into maturity. And given that Rugrats is a show that already centers around the concept of age, a time skip feels organic as both a gimmick episode as well as a concept for a spin-off series. In the case of the All Growed Up special, it was originally only meant to be a one-off event. However, when the episode aired, it pulled record-shattering viewership numbers for Nickelodeon. Viewership numbers that are roughly estimated at around 12 million. How else was Nick supposed to respond to this other than giving an instant green light for a new series? The demand was clearly there. Klasky Chupo, however, didn't really want to create a series based on this new world that All Growed Up introduced us to, though. Most of the reasoning that I was able to discern stated that they simply wanted to keep making more episodes of Rugrats instead of doing that on top of a spin-off as well. But other than stretching their staff even thinner with another show among their currently running hits like Wild Thornberries and Rocket Power, I suspect that a good amount of their hesitancy towards working on All Grown Up was due to the fact that they had recently started a completely separate series that was already targeting a similar, if not the same, demographic. But that's a completely different conversation that we will get to later, I promise. Now this was a complex situation that both Klasky Chupo and Nickelodeon were put in. It's easy for me to understand why Klasky Chupo wouldn't want to go forward with a spin-off series that is so closely connected to the show that put them on the map. It's natural to be protective of your golden goose after all, and if this show didn't perform well, it may sour the legacy of the previous one. However, this is actually a rare instance where I feel like the executives weren't completely misguided in their attempt to cash in on this opportunity. Making All Grown Up made sense both from a business as well as creative perspective. Because by the time Rugrats had reached its 10th anniversary, it was admittedly not the show that it once was. Maybe still a name, but not so much in quality. Ever since they came back from their vacation in Paris, it was a rapid decline towards mediocrity and getting beaten down in the ratings by the likes of Spongebob, who was on track to swiftly dethrone it as Nickelodeon's main cash cow. Even Jimmy Neutron was giving the babies a run for their money. Um, yes, are you going to finish that croissant? It was clear that if this franchise was going to continue, something needed to change, and All Growed Up presented the best possible opportunity to organically move this franchise forward. And well, after only one season of All Grown Up had aired, Rugrats unceremoniously concluded. Unless, of course, you're counting those tales from the crib direct-to-video specials, or the failed Preschool Days series, or the Paramount Plus reboot, which... <laughs> you know what? We're not even gonna go there. I'm a monster! This was pretty sad, considering how they weren't given any semblance of a proper send-off, despite it being on the network for over a decade. Just an assumption that the show succeeding it would carry the torch. And All Grown Up did, running for a total of five seasons until it concluded in 2008 to even less fanfare than what the final season of Rugrats received. It's actually kind of tragic. Sure, five seasons is definitely nothing to sneeze at, but despite our characters being much older now, their infant counterparts left them some pretty big shoes to fill. And over the course of those five seasons, All Grown Up set out to prove one thing, that it was different from its predecessor. And well, they certainly achieved achieved that, but it definitely came at a cost, and that cost was sacrificing many of the factors that ultimately contributed to the success of Rugrats. I mentioned briefly that there is this inherent sense of cynicism within All Grown Up, and that could very well have been the result
result of the lack of enthusiasm and passion behind its creation. But what exactly led me to form this opinion in the first place? Well, let's take a look at the show itself. Alright, I'm going to talk about the special first, as it was originally intended to be our only glimpse into the future that we would ever see for these characters. And that's a heavy set of expectations to place upon it, given that it aired in the second to last season of Rugrats, which is a time that many fans will argue was well after the cracks in the show's foundation began to form. But I'll tell you this, even after rewatching it all these years later, I still love this special. The plot is just basic enough to where it allows us to focus more so on the characters interacting with each other. Both kids and adults alike, and the whole point of the special is told to us right at the beginning as well. But allow me to recap it for you. We open with the babies watching an episode of, or maybe a movie, about this mad scientist by the name of Dr. Spooky. I mean, he's just a guy, I don't really know what's so spooky about him, but okay. And in this program, he creates a time machine, which gets the babies to thinking about how cool it would be to go to the future themselves. But in comes Angelica, being her normal and obnoxious self forcing the babies to be her audience as she plays with her new karaoke machine toy. The babies want to play with it as well, Angelica forbids them, it's pretty standard stuff. But then Tommy, who is tired of being bullied by her, decides to play with it anyway as soon as she leaves the room. She quickly comes back, chases them around for a bit, until they eventually get cornered in the entryway closet. And in that closet, they use their imaginations to quantum leap themselves to an age where they will be big enough so that Angelica can't push them around anymore. But even after this time skip takes place, Place. Where are they? Still in the closet, hiding from Angelica, but it's because this time she wants back the Emika CD that they borrowed from her. Right off the bat, I have to say that I love this transition for the time skip. Not only is it funny that the kids as babies believe that Angelica will leave them alone once they are older, but we're immediately proven the opposite all of these years later. Exiting the closet, we get to see the new looks for the kids too, which I remember being a mind-blowing thing to witness back in the day. Even now, I still love Tommy's design. Like likely due to the fact that seeing him with hair is just jarring the first time around. But everyone else looks great here as well. I especially appreciate the subtle inclusions of patterns, colors, and symbols that were featured on the clothes that they used to wear as babies too. Anyways, the central plot of the special focuses on the kids looking forward to their upcoming Emika concert, while their parents are entering a disco dancing contest that's occurring on the same night. Everyone is hyped up for their respective events, and no semblance of an issue seems like it will happen. That is until Angelica, being the shit stirrer that she still very much is, gives us a conflict. Emika's supposedly wears the same Scorpio medallion that Stu plans on wearing for the dance contest, as it's his lucky charm that allows him to bust moves like Kiryu from Yakuza. <laughs> And in order to impress her new friend Samantha, she tells her that she's going to be wearing it to the concert. Angelica goes to Tommy and asks him to nab it for her, but he refuses until she offers to introduce Samantha to Chucky, who has a crush on her, but only if Tommy can get her Stu's medallion. And being the best bro that he is, Tommy reluctantly agrees. It's a pretty simple conflict to have for a big special like this, but I actually like it a lot, as there are stakes that involve both the parents and the kids. If Tommy doesn't get the medallion for Angelica, Angelica, Chucky won't get a chance to talk to this girl, and if Stu doesn't have the medallion, his confidence to groove to the best of his ability will be shattered. Even though the special inspired what we know to be all grown up, it still feels like an episode of Rugrats. The heart of the show is retained through the involvement of all parties, and the evolution of these characters feels natural. Tommy still cares for his friends a lot, especially Chucky, whose cowardice has now turned into more of a preteen shyness. Seeing Tommy after all of these years continue to go out of his way to help his his friends is pretty endearing, even if his actions are misguided. And to see that Angelica has only grown up to be more clever in how she tries to manipulate others into getting what she wants feels natural as well. Anyways, let's finish this summary up. The plan goes awry after Spike takes the medallion, thinking that it's a dog treat. Tommy gets grounded, Susie shows up, Stu has an existential crisis about not having his medallion, the kids find out that the medallion was buried in the sandbox by Spike, they get it to Stu in time for him to pull off some sick dance moves. Tommy and Angelica reconcile and realize that they love and appreciate each other, despite butting heads every now and again, and everyone ends up getting to go to the Emika concert. And it's at the Emika show where both Tommy and Angelica get invited to go up on stage to sing one of Emika's songs with her, which I admittedly still catch myself singing here and there, all these years later. You're a friend to me, I'm a friend to you. 
when we have each other, there's nothing we can't do. It's a pretty cheesy song, but it is definitely an earworm. Maybe I like the song as much as I do because of how it transitions into a montage of Rugrats clips over the decade that led up to this moment. In a way, it kind of feels like I'm taking a look back at my own childhood. And no, I'm not referring to the fact that I definitely watched way too much Rugrats as a kid. Just want to make that clear. But you just know by the clips that they chose to use that this sequence and this special were a labor of love. I mean, you don't just casually throw in Chucky crying over the dead body of Melville without knowing exactly what you're doing. The sequence is cut when Tommy and Angelica begin to fight yet again, this time over who gets to sing into the mic. As they tug and pull on the mic, taking the fight backstage, we go back in time to their present, where the closet door is now open and Tommy and Angelica are back to fighting over the karaoke machine toy. And that's pretty much the entire special. It's pretty easy to see why this was such a popular episode. You can tell that this was truly meant to be a celebration of how far the series has come in the years that it had been on the air, and that everyone involved wanted this to be memorable. It stayed true to the nature of Rugrats by simply being an extended imagination sequence, and yet it felt like something more than that. Was that something more meant to be an entirely new series? Well, let's figure that out by getting into All Grown Up now. As we begin to dip our toes into the water here, it's important to bring up All Grown Up's theme song, as it's perhaps the most iconic and memorable aspect of the entire series. Even if my opinions on All Grown Up have soured over the years, I still cannot deny that this song goes hard. Farnsworth? The usual, sir. The theme song, which is entitled All Grown Up With You, was written by Mark and Bob Mothersbaugh, both of whom were also the go-to people for composing the music for Rugrats. Yeah, these are the two dudes responsible for those iconic womp womps. <laughs> the song was also performed by Cree Summer, and that's important to note because she is also the voice actor for Susie Carmichael. If I had to describe this song in one word, that word would be angst, as it is very clearly inspired by the ever so popular music of the early 2000s pop punk. And I would know because that trash was all that I listened to from the beginning of middle school all the way to the end of high school. This was my culture, and I have the iPod Touch with a cracked screen to prove it. To this day, I still have quite the soft spot for this theme song, and I believe that it does an excellent job of establishing the intended feel for what this show aims to be. It doesn't cut too deep, however, as when you really take a look at the lyrics, you start to realize just how basic and surface level they are in terms of their meaning, and I believe it's this way due to All Grown Up being a mostly ensemble-driven show. Since the lyrics are meant to represent the collective feelings of our entire main cast, they need to be somewhat simplistic, while the music itself does the emotional heavy lifting by communicating to the audience how these lyrics are meant to be interpreted. They're excited to be older now, but man, growing up is a challenge and mom and dad just don't understand. Am I right, fellow kids? Despite my positive feelings about the song, however, the visuals are undeniably lacking. All that it is is a fast-paced montage with character spotlights sprinkled through throughout it, followed by a quick animation that leads into the title card. I think that this is just fine for the first season of a TV show, I mean it doesn't use original animation like either of the intros for Rugrats, but it does sell the vibe of the show to us in a somewhat dynamic way. But to provide a sneak peek into later discussion, this becomes more of an issue with me as the show enters season 2, which is when All Grown Up experiences a slight yet still very noticeable shift in art style that carries for the rest of the series. And they did absolutely nothing to freshen up the title sequence whatsoever. To me, this is the first major indicator of a present lack of care and passion, because while changes in art direction as a series moves forward aren't completely unheard of, like for example, American Dragon Jake Long, which did a massive leap in looks and style, it feels like updating the intro is the bare minimum that a show could do to reflect this change. Otherwise, your viewers are just going to be confused when the actual episode starts and the characters don't look like how they looked 10 seconds ago. Granted, Jake Long did a major overhaul in art direction, and people have a lot of opinions on which style looked better, but at least through the show's intro you can tell that they are trying to show off the new look in an exciting way. And yeah, I know that money is a factor in this conversation. Animation is obscenely expensive and it could be considered unfair to compare a smaller budget Nickelodeon show that's coming from an outside studio to a Disney show, even if it's a spin-off of one of the most culturally impactful children's cartoons of the previous decade. But here's the thing that really irks me, with All Grown Ups opening staying the same for its whole run. It's 
just a montage of clips from season one. The amount of original animation used here is very small, and all that really needed to be changed was just replacing the season one clips with season two clips, and that would have been sufficient. Kree's vocals don't even need to be replaced by the Jonas Brothers or whatever Nick equivalent boy band they had at the time. This was before Big Time Rush, so that wasn't an option. <laughs> I know that this can be interpreted as rather nitpicky here, but I think the lack of action and cobbling together some new visuals for the intro keys into what I've already been saying about the lack of enthusiasm behind this project since day one. Rather than just sitting here criticizing something, I also decided that in the spirit of fairness, I'd take a crack at making an updated title sequence. Here's what I did in an afternoon. Four, three, two, one. I rest my case. The show's intro, in my opinion, serves as a precursor to the issues that are present within this series, and that's where I'm going to end my thoughts on it, as we have way more important things to discuss now. That's Chucky, Tommy, Phil, Phil, Lil, Susie, Kimmy, and Angelica. Coming up next. The kids have all grown up have definitely changed over the years, some for the better and some definitely for the worse. Considering that we have a frame of reference for how these characters acted as infants, there comes a certain set of expectations to see if how they've matured is in line with what we already know about them. Do they meet those expectations? Well, let's find out. First up is of course Tommy. While I previously stated that this is an ensemble driven show, and I do stand by that statement, Tommy is the closest thing that we have to a protagonist in this series. And this is illustrated by how much more characterization he receives in comparison to everyone else. That was also the case in Rugrats, sure, but it stands out to me a bit more here and I'll explain why. In All Grown Up, Tommy is shown to have a strong passion for filmmaking, and I have to say that I really like this direction for his character. It feels natural natural for him given how he has always been the one taking command of their imaginary adventures in the previous series, much like how any director would run a film set. There are two episodes that revolve around this interest of his and his supposed talent, one of which involves him making a film for a contest and the other takes place after he wins a separate contest for a film that we never see. Despite not seeing his movie though, we are assured that Tommy is destined for nothing short of greatness. I'm a done deal the eventual greatest filmmaker ever. At the time of this show's airing, I had a lot of personal connection to Tommy's character, as I was a child that greatly desired a creative outlet for my own imagination. For all I know, that was my first indicator that I was meant to pursue a career in which I am encouraged to be creative. But now that I am actually in that sort of creative career that I so desperately longed for as a kid, in the film industry no less, I got a few issues with the way they handled this aspect of Tommy. First off, what I'm about to mention here in relation to Tommy plays into a larger issue that this show struggles with, which is that despite the show being called All Grown Up, Tommy and all of his friends are still kids. The show takes place 9 to 10 years in the future, which makes our main cast between the ages of 9 and 13. I'm 10! Who needs this kind of pressure? And that's the average age range for a lot of Nicktoon characters, because that's just their primary demographic. For example, Fairly Odd Parents, Jimmy Neutron, and Hey Arnold all feature casts of characters that fall within that range. Yet none of them had to prove themselves in the way that All Grown Up did. Through the title alone, newfound maturity was expected for these characters, but they were also locked into an age that the unintended pilot special established. And the entire point of that special was to show that things weren't really that different. But in order to set itself apart, different was what this show had to be. Anyways, what were we talking about here? Um, oh yeah, Tommy. When I see Tommy referring to himself as an artiste and see his family and friends take this dream of his so seriously, Seriously, I can't help but find all of it to be kind of laughable and unrealistic. Like bro, you're literally 10. And it's especially worse when you see the kinds of movies that he's making. 
What's crazy about this though, and I'm sure that this is going to sound silly and I hope that it makes sense to you, but his movies are this advanced level of bad. Like too amateur to be considered good, but too proficient for it to feel believable that a 10 year old could have made them. All of the examples of his work that we get to see feel somewhat reminiscent of a high schooler that just learned how to use iMovie. They're bad, but they're somehow better than what someone his age should be able to make, so I guess he could be a prodigy in that regard. I mean, all that I was making at his age were Windows Movie Maker slideshows of stolen DeviantArt pictures of Naruto characters, which I'd set to copyrighted music and then upload them to YouTube. It was truly the Wild West of this site back then, wasn't it? But I'm bringing all of this up as this was one of the first things that I noticed in All Grown Up that made me raise an eyebrow. But this is my art, my passion! And even as I'm saying this, I can feel myself growing insecure over my palpable cynicism, as I am definitely putting what could be considered an unfair amount of scrutiny on this cartoon that is intended for an age demographic that I am now well beyond. But isn't that what everyone else on this website does? The answer is yes. Yes, they do. So I'm going to give myself a pass here. Filmmaking being the core aspect of Tommy's character does eventually get put on the back burner as the show progresses, to the point where you kind of forget about it until you see him randomly holding a camera or someone asks him to film or edit something. I don't know. Maybe they had the same thought process that I did and wanted to distance themselves from making this his whole personality, but Tommy unfortunately went on to become blander as a result and became honestly pretty unlikable by the time All Grown Up reached its final season. In my opinion, Tommy reaches his worst points in seasons 4 and 5, as these seasons feature episodes that involve one of the show's few recurring plotlines, which is that Tommy gets a girlfriend. The reason why I consider this time period to be him at his worst is that at the start of their relationship, he lies to her about his family history, saying that his dad is a rabbi. Which, I'll admit, is kind of funny considering the fact that Stu isn't even Jewish. I'm not even Jewish. But he creates this lie because he met her through going to Hebrew school, something that he very much didn't want to do initially. Judaism is a very fundamental aspect of her life, and Tommy recognizes that. So in order to impress her and get closer to her, he just lies. Eventually, of course, after the lie is revealed, I'm not even Jewish, and she understandably dumps him, he apologizes and she decides to give him another chance. Which I really wish that she didn't do, but I guess the lesson is to reward honest behavior here. Even if he was being dishonest for most of the episode, but go off, I guess. Except, he keeps lying. In fact, it's almost as if they decided to make being a chronic liar a part of his character. Near the end of the series, Tommy and Rachel break up for good because she's moving away. Oh yeah, I don't think I mentioned her by name yet. Her name is Rachel. She just doesn't really have much of a character other than being Tommy's girlfriend, I'm sorry. Tommy though is shocked at how fine he is about the whole situation, to the point where he's ready to move on pretty quickly. But none of his friends really believe that he's fine, to the point where they are annoying him incessantly with their friendship and support, so he decides to fake being upset about his breakup in order to appease them, in hopes that they will eventually let the subject die. But this actually ends up having the opposite effect, as they just can't stand seeing how sad Tommy is. So out of the kindness of their hearts, the gang decides to pool together what little funds they have, in order to surprise Tommy by bringing Rachel into town for the weekend. And the timing to surprise Tommy is great, because in the episode's B-plot, Dill is having a big party. That's about all you really need to know. But unbeknownst to them, Tommy decides to let everyone know at this party that he's feeling better, and he's gonna do so by bringing a date. But oh no! Rachel and this other girl are showing up at the same time, and thus the liar is revealed once again. Once his friends learn about his lie, they literally leave Tommy there to deal with the mess on his own, and he inevitably gets yelled at by both of these girls. So this time around, he doesn't get any second chances, which is nice. Rachel! Chillax, bro. I don't like thinking about Tommy in this way, though. Sure, maybe making him a prodigy filmmaker was a bit ambitious at the start, but to see him devolve into such a bland jerk of a character is kind of sad to see. Who asked you? But you know who isn't a bland character whatsoever? <laughs> Dylan Prescott Pickles. Yeah, he has a middle name and so does Tommy too. It's Malcolm for some reason. Life is unfair. If Tommy is the closest thing to a protagonist that we have in this show, then our deuteragonist is most definitely Dill, as he in a lot of ways stands out the most in comparison to everyone else. And that's for better or for worse. You respond with the first thing that comes to mind. 
Hot. Hot. Cool. Cool. Stop it. Stop it. He didn't have any semblance of a character in Rugrats, as he was only able to communicate through iconic phrases such as... Wee wee. So he was a bit of a blank canvas in terms of what they could do with him. And boy, oh boy, did they give him a character. In the All Grown Up special, we can see that he's a little goofier in comparison to the rest of the cast, but not to the point where I'd classify him as weird. Just a silly younger brother character. How come you have to wear that thing on your head and not on your arms? Angelica, however, makes a comment in the special to Phil and Lil that she knows about when they supposedly dropped him on his head when he was a baby. And to me, that just seems like a throwaway line that is meant to characterize Phil and Lil more so than Dill, since an event like that is par the course for how rambunctious they already were. But I think the writers of All Grown Up recalled that line and kicked it into maximum, maximum overdrive. overdrive for his final form in All Grown Up, because now Dill is just a straight up weirdo. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in, and I don't want to fit in. Have you ever seen me without this stupid hat on? That's weird. In my opinion, Dill is actually the best character in the show, purely for the reason that he brings something to the table that wasn't there before. That's not to say that his antics don't get grating at times, especially when his commitment to the bit gets annoying even for the rest of the characters, but more often than not, he's pretty well-meaning and innocent in comparison to everyone else. He acts as sort of the mediator of the group, likely due to the fact that while he is weird, people are able to acknowledge that he's much more easygoing and relaxed in times of crisis. Which is kind of funny, considering that most of their crises are much less interesting and smaller scale in comparison to whatever hijinks he's getting involved with in his B-plots. But every time it's a Dill-centric episode, you know you're in for an experience, because not only is he likely to be at his weirdest, but his episodes often end with him being correct for his strange beliefs. And that adds an entirely different layer to the show where supernatural entities turn out to be real, but in a very casual sense. He gets abducted by aliens in one episode, and then in another, he sees both Bigfoot and Nessie while also unknowingly befriending the ghost of a dead pioneer child. Isn't he great? That was a special though, they never went that crazy ever again. But one of my favorite Dill episodes of the entire series is the one where he creates an imaginary friend named Izzy. As Dill first starts introducing people to Izzy, they kind of shrug it off at first, making us think that this is just some silly B-plot setup, while the A-plot focusing on Chucky running for school safety commissioner seems to be what the episode is all about. It's kind of creepy. But kids around the school very quickly embrace the bit, to the point where seemingly overnight, Izzy Izzy becomes the most popular kid in school, going as far as students campaigning for Izzy to run against Chucky in the school's upcoming election. But everything comes to a head when Chucky does something. Chucky, you just ran over Izzy! <laughs> Holy f that is so messed up. As a result of his murder, <laughs> Everyone in the school begins to shun Chucky, resulting in him becoming a social pariah. Dill bails him out at the end though by literally throwing a memorial assembly for Izzy, coming clean at the end by saying that Izzy was never real to begin with. The truth! It hurts! It hurts like nails! And you would think that that would be the end of it, but then after Chucky thanks him, Dill claims that Izzy actually pulled through and is currently sitting in the back of the auditorium. And as Dill and Chucky begin to leave, the camera pans to show that one of the seats may not actually be empty. Perhaps the problem that most plagues Dill is that he is the best character, which results in him frequently being shoehorned into episodes and stealing the spotlight from others. I don't think that's necessarily his fault though, because in a way, his character possesses what I believe to be the closest remnant we have to the spirit of the original series, and as a result of this, the negative characteristics of the others shine brighter in comparison. Which brings me to the next person on our list. <laughs> So, Chucky sucks. He just sucks. I don't believe that he deserves happiness, or really anything that he wants, in fact. Harsh words, I know, and they're probably too harsh, but I definitely have some opinions on this guy. In Rugrats, 
Chucky is primarily defined by being the most scared and apprehensive of the group, begrudgingly agreeing to adventures after receiving a pep talk from his best pal Tommy, because no matter how scared of the situation he might be, Chucky cares for not only his own well-being, but the well-being of his friends as well. Admittedly, I've never really cared too much for Chucky, but it was still pretty easy to sympathize with him, especially when they began the subplot of how his mother passed away before he really got the opportunity to know her, which of course led us into the second movie. But when it comes comes to Chucky and All Grown Up, his cowardice has now been replaced by massive insecurity, and he handles his insecurities in the worst possible ways, usually by overcompensating, lying to his friends and family, I'm not selling the whole thing. I'll trade one teacher little stamp for one deck of cards. Oh, good, you tried. Let's go. Another deck, my good man. Last one, I swear! Or even in some cases, just being a straight up dick. What are you looking at, fat man? Give me a break. The holidays are stressful. <laughs> Remember how earlier I was complaining about how Tommy lies? Well, a lot of that actually pales in comparison to what Chucky does. In one of the first episodes of the series, Chucky creates an alter ego that he calls Chongo. Hello, I am Chongo. Which he uses to get closer to this girl that he has a crush on, whose name is Nicole. And like how a lot of these plots go in shows, he takes it way too far and is eventually found out by her. And the lesson learned here, which is the case with a lot of Chucky episodes, is that he should just stay true to himself because people like him for who he really is. Except me. I'm not people. This evolution of his character is just so off-putting to me. Sure, he shouldn't have to be the designated coward of the group forever, but there could have been much better ways for him to grow out of this quality without having him lean so heavily into toxicity. Chucky is a character that the audience is typically meant to sympathize with in most cases. He's been wrong in the past, sure. I mean, all of these characters have. But it feels kind of insulting to see him devolve into such an inconsiderate jerk. And while I'm on the subject of Chucky being an inconsiderate jerk, I might as well talk about Kimmy as well here, because while she's tangentially related to this rant, there unfortunately isn't much to say about her outside of being related to Chucky. Whenever we have an episode that features Kimmy as the main focus, Chucky is almost always shoehorned into the plot as well, usually leading into some sort of argument or misunderstanding between the two of them, resulting in Chucky later apologizing to her. Because rarely ever do these episodes focus on how Kimmy feels, and more so on how Chucky is responding to the situation that Kimmy finds herself in. For example, her first episode of the series involves her befriending the local bad boy at school. See? Yeah. You know he's bad, because his name only has one letter. The amount of time that Kimmy is spending with Z prompts Chucky to go into overbearing older brother mode, stalking them both in order to prove that Z is dangerous, when in reality, he's actually a much better guy than everyone else in the show. He participates in a lot of charity work with his dad, and asks Kimmy to help out with prep for a fundraiser. But Chucky, who is completely unaware of everything I just said, gets Tommy, Dill, and Phil to intercept them on the way to set fundraiser, even going as far as calling the cops in advance. So basically, Chucky profiled Z and his dad, which is actually, uh, very f***ed up. It's a don't judge a book by their cover plot, and I can say that with certainty because they literally say that phrase in the episode. Dad, what happened to the don't judge a book by its cover speech? Well, it's different now, because the book is hanging around with my daughter! Chucky later plays the overbearing sibling card again in the last season of the show, when he discovers that someone carved the initials TP plus KF into the wall of his family's garage. And yes, those are the initials of Tommy and Kimmy. But the way that Chucky reacts is to immediately get mad at Tommy and tell him that liking his sister goes against the rules of being best friends. If only there was some way I could convince him that... I'm completely unattractive to you. Exactly. It's also important to mention that this is also during the time when Tommy is still with Rachel, who while not being a part of this episode is at least mentioned by Tommy when Chucky is accusing him and even throwing out the ultimatum that they shouldn't be best friends at all now. He mentions this seven minutes into the episode by the way. This is basically all happening in one day. But after they stop talking to each other officially, Kimmy confesses that she was the one who did the carving two years ago, hoping that it will repair their friendship. Only for Chucky to say this. Don't you feel better? No. 
Now it's worse! When they do eventually reconcile, Chucky admits that he was mostly mad about how Tommy is seemingly perfect and gets everything that he wants. But while this is definitely just me reading into things that aren't intended to be there, this weird sibling dynamic that Chucky seems to have with Kimmy just makes me think that Chucky is the one who is in love with Kimmy, which makes me now irritated and disgusted by him. The episode does have a funny ending though, with Tommy and Kimmy both stealing looks at each other and their eyes softening in a way that definitely implies that the feelings are still there. It's a knock against the whole series that Kimmy's constantly overshadowed by Chucky, but at least they give her a good few moments that are more memorable in a positive way than most others in the series. Apart from Z, episodes that place the focus on Kimmy tend to deal with her identity and how that ties into her family, hence why Chucky always seems to have a role to play as her adopted brother. In the season 2 episode Memoirs of a Finster, she decides to look into her own family lineage as opposed to the Finsters, as they aren't technically her ancestors. Five yen? And as a result, she becomes engrossed in learning about her culture. Ultimately, it's a pretty good thing for her to do, and she even makes some considerable attempts to include her friends in on this experience, although they respond in some pretty intolerant ways. She ends up joining the Japanese club in response to all of this so that she can learn more about her culture in a positive environment. But then Chucky proceeds to get jealous of his lack of inclusion, leading to a bit of a blow up on his part in reaction to her family tree that doesn't have him or his dad on it. And let me tell you something, sister! Bird poop is a lot thicker than water! Bro! No! Anyways, Kimmy makes a clever change to her project by adding an adopted family tree as well after taking Chucky's feelings into consideration. But she didn't need to do that, as this whole plot basically boils down to Chucky feeling entitled about being included, which low-key, kinda typical toxic white person behavior. But that just proves pretty much all the other points that I've already made about him. There's another episode later on where Chucky is much less of a jerk to his sister. It's about Kimmy feeling as though her biological father has stopped caring about her now that he has a new wife and child, but the episode feels like a whole lot of nothing as it's mostly about Chucky trying to make her feel better when she won't even tell him what's wrong in the first place, leading him to- hold on, let me check my notes here. Completely destroying her room in an attempt to give it an extreme makeover home edition-esque redesign? God, I fucking hate Chucky, dude, I'm moving on. Now let's talk about the more established siblings of the series. Phil and Lil. I'm going to talk about them together here because much like Rugrats, they are pretty much a package deal still. In Rugrats, they were practically a single character just split into two, but now that they're getting older, they're starting to form separate identities. Originally, they liked all things gross and would constantly get into messes, and while Phil continues to be gross, Lil doesn't really want people to associate her with those same gross things that Phil enjoys. Don't you guys ever get tired of talking about sports and bodily functions? <laughs> On paper, I really like this idea of their relationship straining due to their lives pulling them in different directions. However, this turns into an issue rather quickly when you begin to notice that all of their episodes revolve around the fact that they are twins. The very first episode of All Grown Up actually focuses on them, with Lil starting to become more popular at school and getting invited to a cool kid party, whereas Phil does not, as the popular kids are very off-put by his behavior and also his stench, apparently. Definitely fish taco. Oh, that's nasty. This leads to Lil doing her best to distance herself from her brother both at school and at home. But when she actually gets to the party and everyone begins to make fun of Phil behind his back, Lil realizes that these people actually suck and starts to defend him, with the end of the episode resulting in them embracing their similarities. Yeah! My room. Overall, not a bad episode, and honestly, a good start to the series. But they do this dynamic over and over and over again in episodes to follow, having them butt heads over their differences or encroaching upon what they feel like belongs to them. In a later episode, Lil joins Phil's soccer team, and while Phil is supportive at first, he starts to become insecure and protective of his hobby when he realizes that Lil is significantly better at it than he is. She quits after he guilts her for a while about taking his thing, but but then once the team starts to struggle again, he apologizes and asks her to rejoin. So this time around, it was Phil who learned the lesson about excluding his sibling and how he should accept her for who she is. Another episode has them throwing separate birthday parties because they realize they are both now going through puberty and it makes them uncomfortable to think about how they are becoming more different. 
But it ultimately ends with them realizing that it's okay to be different from each other, and that they are still similar in a lot of ways. So now they are learning the same lesson, just at the same time. And then an episode after that involves Lil's best friend developing a crush on Phil and vice versa, resulting in Lil getting upset and that's... Wait, that's just like the Tommy and Kimmy episode again. Except this episode was before that. But I feel like that still proves my point about how they keep recycling plot lines. Nothing interesting was really done with Phil and Lil, so I feel as though they got done the most dirty out of the whole group. Sure, they may have gotten more individual attention than, say, Kimmy. However, Kimmy at least had some uniqueness to her episodes, whereas these two suffer from this lack of originality in giving them things to do. And as a result, I don't really have anything left to say about Phil and Lil. So how about we shift our focus towards the last two characters in our main cast that thankfully have a lot more to do. You can find beauty in the strangest places. So believe it or not, I actually like what they did with Angelica in All Grown Up. Her brattiness has evolved into being more of a mean girl, and along with this reshaping of her ego, is a poorly hidden inferiority complex. Referencing back to Chucky for a second, as I mentioned how he too has an inferiority complex, and how I feel as though it works against his character, it works completely opposite for Angelica, which is a nice change of pace, considering that we as an audience are accustomed to rooting against her 90% of the time. I mean, she was a brat and a bully when she was three, and she is still a brat and a bully here too. But now she is held more accountable for her behavior and called out for it much more frequently, forcing her to actually take personal inventory for a change. I'm sorry. I don't know why I keep doing these things, but now I'm being punished for it. I didn't actually expect to be giving Angelica praise here, but when I really think about why she stands out more positively in comparison to the others, is likely due to the fact that she was already horrible to begin with. Nobody else was, they had to work on becoming jerks, while being mean has been all that Angelica's ever known. Watching her reflect upon her own actions is actually pretty refreshing to see. There's an episode in season 2 where she has to work at the hospital as a candy striper, which I'm not sure how she ended up with that sort of job. Maybe she committed a crime or something and this is her community service. I mean, that would track. She speeds through the workday so that she can go to the mall and in the process treats all of the patients horribly. It isn't until she herself ends up in the hospital by, well, breaking her nose and faking a mental condition, yeah, I never said she was a great person despite being better bear with me, that she realizes how self-absorbed she's been, thanks to the kind yet also savage words of this sickly child. You look different. Yesterday you were mean and in a hurry. Today you look mean and kind of crazy. You're trying to make me look as bad as you? I don't think that's possible. Yeah, you're right. You're kind of nice for a crazy looking girl. We should have just gotten the whole show of him. It would have been so much better. She has another episode in season 3, where she signs up to audition for a singing performance at school. Susie is absent that day, and while I still have yet to talk about her and her singing capabilities, take my word for it when I say that she's much better, and the show has made that abundantly clear to us by this point. <laughs> Grade. Angelica sees this as her golden opportunity, not wanting to tell Susie about it as it will ruin her chances, but Tommy and Dill guilt her into calling the house. A quick side note, but this is one of those moments where I realize just how old this show is. Like having a cell phone is practically a character quality with Angelica, as it exemplified status back then, whereas everyone else still relies on a house phone. Anyways, I chalk this next part up as an act of God but the answering machine breaks as she's leaving the message, and Susie misses the audition as a result. Angelica was able to tell that it was breaking as she was leaving the message, but she's initially fine about all of this, as it guaranteed that she would get to perform while also saving face with Susie and the others. And somehow, she lands the gig. We never see the audition take place, but she gets it. I just hope that she got better over the last two seasons. But prior to her performance, she gets a massive pimple on her face that refuses to go away. And since she wasn't truthful to Susie, she gets convinced by Dill that it's karma getting back at her. She tries some good deeding around town with him, only to later confess to Susie before she goes on stage that she knew the answering machine was busted and didn't call back, asking for forgiveness and allowing Susie to take the stage in her place. I wouldn't go out on a limb to say that this was one of the best episodes of All Grown Up, however I do think that it's one of the best resolutions for Angelica that we do get to see. Fire! 
Don't get me wrong, I enjoy it when we get to see characters suffer from the consequences of their own actions, which was kind of Angelica's MO back in Rugrats, but I feel like she's done enough of that by this point. She shouldn't have to be defined by her most negative qualities and receive punishments or humiliation every single time. She's allowed to grow, which leads me into what I think holds her back the most. Make sure that popcorn's still hot. On my way! Weirdly enough, my biggest gripe with Angelica has to do with her friend slash simp, Harold. He's not getting a full-on analysis here because that's literally all that he is, mostly just serving as someone there to boost her ego and to be a doormat. Don't worry, I'll be with you when you have half of a brain, a quarter of a brain, an eighth of a brain, even a brainlet! He does rebel against Angelica here and there, throwing the occasional curveball when he realizes his worth for an episode or two, but I don't think his inclusion here does anyone any favors. I get that he was technically a Rugrats character first, only showing up as a minor character in the later seasons, but I don't know why he had to be brought over into All Grown Up as well. His inclusion doesn't add to the group dynamic in any meaningful way. He simply pines over Angelica and she treats him like garbage as a result. Having this constant source of validation around her only prevents her from growing as a character, so it's frustrating to me whenever this dude pops up. The rivalry that she has with Savannah, who's the most popular girl in school, benefits her far more in comparison, as she's almost always presented with the choice to be the bigger person in a situation where they are both being immature. Angelica desperately wants her approval, as it comes with approval from the entire school. Yet when she takes a step back, she realizes that it's more important to value the friends that she already has, as opposed to seeking validation from people that don't like her for who she is. And while sure, Harold likes Angelica for who she is, he never really challenges her to be better, hence why whenever he goes against what she wants, it never incites any honest reflection on her part other than, maybe I should be more nice to my simp. Whereas with Susie, she actually challenges and calls out Angelica pretty frequently, because true friends don't care about what you perceive your flaws to be, and they want you to be your best possible self. And with that being said, let's talk about this true friend, shall we? Last up is Susie. In my Rugrats video, I mentioned that Susie was the best character out of the whole cast, and I'm gonna be real with you right now. She's still the best character, don't get me wrong. I think that like all of our characters, they still could have done something more interesting with Susie, but the favoritism is just so obvious. And I think that it's largely due to the fact that Cree Summer is kind of the most talented cast member in the show, and they wanted to capitalize on that as much as possible. It's okay to admit that, I would too. And I'm not saying that everyone else else isn't doing their best or that they aren't talented. Cree Summer is just built different, I don't know. And don't go in the comments and tell me, but Nancy Cartwright is Chucky and Bart Simpson. Yes, she is, along with like six other characters in The Simpsons, and no one can take that away from her. But also, even if you're gonna play that kind of game with me, it's undeniable that they wanted to use Cree Summer however much they could here. In fact, let me ask you a question. Did you know that Cree Summer can sing? I'll answer it for you. Yes, you do. Going all the way back to the first Rugrats movie, we were treated to Susie Carmichael singing a song that I can only describe as an aggressive earworm that has tightly nestled itself into some place unreachable in my ear canal since the day I first saw this film. A baby is a little chicken, the baby is a puppy chicken. It was already established in that series that Susie enjoys singing. So when all grown up, much like what we saw with Tommy and his filmmaking aspirations, they made Susie's singing abilities and dreams to go professional someday a fundamental part of her grown up self. She's not just into singing, of course. She is aggressively type A, taking her grades and her extracurriculars apart from singing very seriously. I do if I'm gonna make time for language practice, song rehearsal, homework, wardrobe, and occasional happy burger it's only three days before the finals and the audition and your question just threw me off by nine seconds She's definitely got the most going on out of everybody, and we do see her crack under the pressure at times. But unlike how they dialed back on Tommy with his filmmaking pursuits, they never really did that with Susie. As if hearing her sing the theme song at the start of every episode wasn't enough, we are given multiple Susie performances throughout the entire series. Her first episode actually is about her trying to get represented by this talent agent for her singing, only to learn that she was being scammed and how easy it is to get manipulated by strangers, especially when they are promising your hopes and dreams on a silver platter. You hang out with someone you don't even know. Say yes to whatever she asks you to do? She could have taken it a lot further than she did. Think about it! A lot of after-school special vibes in this one. Getting to the point though, we hear her sing three separate times in this episode. And then a few episodes later, she's 
singing her lines instead of just saying her lines in Tommy's movie. And then a few more episodes later, she's singing a... What's the haps? Very bad original song for Tommy's surprise party. And then we get to season 2, episode 6, Susie's Choice, or Run Around Susie. This episode has two titles for some reason. But it's in this episode that she sings a song that's called Where I Start. Look in the mirror, tell me what I see. All of the things that I could be. And it's fine. It's kind of cheesy, but not irritating, and it shows Cree's range better than any of the other songs she's sung for the show up to this point. But I think they realized that this song worked for Susie on a lot of levels. So instead of spending time and money in creating new songs for Susie to sing throughout the series like they did in season 1, they have her sing Where I Start multiple times across the entire series, all more than likely pulled from a single day of recording. And I don't know about you, but it got kind of annoying every time she'd start singing because I knew that the first thing that'd come out of her mouth would be Look in the mirror, tell me what I see. I will say that upon editing this video and scanning through the footage of later seasons, she does in fact sing other songs here and there. The most notable and well done being her rendition of the first Noel. No. But compare that to the song that she sings in the last special of the series, and uh... When I was a little tyke, I thought there was one kind of cheese. Oh my god, never mind. I take back everything that I just said about the Mirror song. I think a lot of my frustrations about this revolve around the fact that Cree was working a lot around this time. In fact, she still is, because she's Cree f***ing Summer. But even though Susie was given more to work with than a lot of the other characters in All Grown Up, I don't think that the same statement necessarily applies to Cree Summer. As I've said previously, this show was more so fueled by obligation rather than passion. And as a result, the lack of love and care is present across all departments bleeding into the final product. And unfortunately, I think the performances of the actors are a byproduct of that as well. I've seen Cree do amazing work over the years, but her performance as Susie in All Grown Up admittedly feels a bit phoned in to me. And I can honestly say the same thing about the entire cast, who I might add are all extremely talented. I don't think I can emphasize that enough. What I think all of this ultimately boils down to is just weak writing. Susie on the surface is a good character, but when you don't utilize the potential that character holds and play it safe the entire time, it's going to result in a lack of enthusiasm from the actor to bring their best to the table. Essentially, that character is going to become just another paycheck to the actor, which is really sad to think about. Well, that was a bummer. Oh, yeah. We're finally through the main cast, so how about we shift our focus towards the supporting cast, or rather, the adult characters of All Grown Up. This video would probably be double its length if I talked about each adult individually, so I'm going to save us all some time and talk about the adults as a whole. It also works out this way because the parents have all been given significantly reduced roles in comparison to how prominently they were featured in Rugrats. With the kids now being older and dealing with quote-unquote real-world problems, it appears that the decision was made to sideline the parents considerably. And by doing that, the show loses that juxtapositional storytelling that Rugrats is known for. Everyone is living in the same reality now, and the kids are old enough to where they can have their own storylines going on. So as a result, the presence of their parents has now been reduced to the occasional guiding voice, comic relief, or the straight-up antagonist of some episodes. And as the number one fan of Stu Pickles, I take massive offense to this. Izzy's a different kind of friend. Stop doing that. I understand that adolescent rebellion and thinking your parents aren't cool is a thing that we all go through, but I think that this issue within All Grown Up goes much deeper than just that. Part of the charm of Rugrats and why it worked so well was in the alternation of perspectives that would occur. So to remove that aspect means that you are surrendering a crucial component of your series identity. And while you might be thinking that this was an inevitability as the kids are now coming into their own, I have to disagree. Rugrats had so much obvious heart to it and it was always most clear 
character in the tender moments that were shared between the parents and the kids. The converging of perspectives, if you will. The love between these characters was so clear in all of their interactions, and now it's more commonplace for the actual grown-ups to be more like second thoughts in the lives of their kids. And again, I get it, it's normal for kids of this age to start pulling away from their parents, but instead of all grown up taking the opportunity to focus on the trials and tribulations that real families go through at this point in their lives, they opted to reduce the parents' roles to basically recurring guest stars, except for maybe Betty and Chaz who run the Java Lava, which functions as the popular hangout spot for the kids. Whoa! Incoming! <laughs> But while I'm on the subject of locations, a lot of the reason as to why the parents are featured much less in All Grown Up also has to do with the fact that the kids spend most of their time at school, as opposed to being at home. So now the adults that they interact with the most are the school staff, the most prominent of which are Vice Principal Pangborn, <laughs> I even picked out my socks this morning, and the English teacher, Miss O'Keets. You're not a teenager, are you, Chucky? Huh? I have a lot of issues with this middle school setting in itself, but Vice Principal Pangborn and Miss O'Keets are what I take a much larger issue with, as they very much so do not have their shit together mentally or emotionally. Most of the time that they get involved with the plot, it's because they need help from the kids in ways that I can only describe as either pathetic or a severe overstep in the boundaries that students and teachers need to have established. Shelly thy Shelly, we belong together thy Shelly. When we're first introduced to them separately, Painborn is seen as this intimidating authoritarian figure with anger issues, but he is also shown to have a more romantic side, expressing his less aggressive emotions through writing poetry. Her leafy tendrils did brush my tank top. So don't screw up! And this is the side of him that appeals to Miss O'Keets. She's initially portrayed as the whimsical hippie of the faculty, wishing to enrich the lives of children and the community through art and culture. <laughs> if you want to call it that. But when she's mad, she has a very hard time hiding it, projecting it onto either the kids or Pangborn. These two provide little to no help or guidance for the kids. They're just two sad sacks that need literal children to fix their issues. It just feels like such a step down from what we used to see from the adult characters in Rugrats. Not to say that stupidity or incompetency weren't prevalent, I mean the terrible parenting on display was part of the fun. But since these two are meant to carry some sort of authority over the kids, Seeing them prove repeatedly that they aren't as much of an obstacle or even a support system for them feels like energy wasted, when that energy could have been better spent showing us how the parents have grown up over the decade as well. I'll give the writers credit in one department though, and this was probably the most pleasant surprise to come out of rewatching this show. The writers of All Grown Up had a clear favorite character from the original series that they wanted to devote some time and attention to in regards to fleshing them out in some genuinely interesting ways. That character character is Grandpa Boris. My chicks! <laughs> Since Grandpa Lou lived with the Pickles for most of the original series, we didn't see nearly as much of Dee Dee's mother and father, Minka and Boris. Their most remembered episodes were the holiday specials for Hanukkah and Passover, both of which are still highly regarded as being some of the best episodes in the whole series. A Mecca baby's gonna do what a Mecca baby's gonna do! Much like Grandpa Lou, Boris was a storyteller, but outside of educating the kids about the cultural importance of these holidays, he never really had much to do. Which is why both him and Minka felt more like rare pop-in characters instead of constantly recurring ones. However, while Minka makes only a single appearance in the entirety of All Grown Up, Boris has three episodes where he is directly involved with the plot, and all three of them are easily in my personal top 10 favorite episodes for this whole series. His first episode involves Tommy and Dill dragging him into a water park unknowingly, after he recently gets cataract surgery. My schnauzer! Since up until this point, we've only known Boris to be a rather dry and curmudgeonly character, so we expect that once he realizes where he is to get either overwhelmed or angry, he instead reacts in the complete opposite way, going down every slide possible and basically acting in every way that a man his age would not. It's honestly very endearing to watch, especially once security gets involved. Nobody is able to tame this beast. Ah, stop it! I'm a senior citizen! I can do whatever I want! There he is! Get him! His second episode? I'm going to skip over briefly, because I'm going to use it to introduce the next section, but his third episode is amazing as well, as it involves him and Lou getting into an actual brawl over who the best grandpa is. Tia!
I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think Boris is my favorite now. I am a Boris guy. It's just wild to me to see that Boris out of all characters got this amount of love. But an old guy's gotta do what an old guy's gotta do. But as we start to wind down here, I wanna talk about what I think is the most important aspect of All Grown Up to discuss. As mentioned previously, there is another episode of All Grown Up that features Grandpa Boris, but this one has much more significance to it, as we are treated to another one of his stories, but this time around, it's about how he came to meet Minka back in Russia. She was a butcher's daughter, while I was just a lowly tailor's son. Hey, what chance did I have? What chance do I have? None. I've actually talked about this episode already, as this is the one where Tommy first meets Rachel. And while this may come as a surprise, it's my opinion that this is the best episode of All Grown Up. Not because of Tommy, but because of Boris. Boris is telling Tommy this story as a way to teach him about the ways of love, and how it eventually worked out for him back in the day. Tommy makes a lot of missteps in this episode, the biggest of which is his lie to her about Stu being a rabbi. I'm not even Jewish. But with each error that he makes, Boris tells Tommy more about his own journey to finding his love, even sharing his own mistakes in order to parallel Tommy's experience. There's just something so nostalgic about the story to me. And it's not even because he's recalling a bygone era of his life. The tone just feels so reminiscent of the Rugrats episodes that featured Boris. Perhaps it's due to the familiarity of his narration to my ears, combined with the new information that we're receiving about him and Minka. We never got this detailed of a backstory for any of the adults and how they came together. Only small anecdotes here and there. So to dedicate an entire episode to fleshing out Boris and Minka's relationship, it carries a lot of weight to it, and I believe that this taps into the emotions that should have defined All Grown Up from the beginning, as the show shines its brightest when the characters are allowed to reflect on what it means to grow up. Whether it's the grandparents, the parents, or the kids, I think that this show is at its best when the characters find themselves in situations that allow them to reflect in a meaningful way. They don't have to live in the past, per se. I mean, the show is already considered nostalgia bait. But rather than trying to run away from the shadow of their predecessor, why why not embrace it? Way before this episode with Boris, the first episode of All Grown Up that evokes this idea of reflection is the season 2 episode Saving Cynthia. In this episode, we see Angelica asking her mom to get rid of all her pre-13 possessions, not realizing that by making this request, it meant that her Cynthia doll from Rugrats was going to be disposed of as well. Cynthia? If you made it this far into the video, then I don't think I need to explain to you just how much Cynthia means to Angelica. Despite not having played with Cynthia for years at this point, it practically destroys her, enlisting the help of both Susie and Harold in order to track her down and go to some extreme lengths to take her back. I really enjoyed this episode for a number of reasons, but I think the biggest is that it goes directly against what the show has been trying to sell us for the past season and a half. While Angelica is the biggest accuser thus far of being in a rush to grow up and leave any trace of her childhood behind, this is still something that all of these characters are guilty of. And it comes out of left field a bit to see the most adamant of the group caving in such a desperate yet endearing way. Angelica's love for Cynthia hasn't gone away, even if she had to be reminded of it by losing her. And even though they do end up recovering Cynthia in the end, Angelica makes an even grander realization that her friendship with Susie, something that has been there since childhood, is something that she values more. All in all, a great episode for Angelica that makes a solid solid statement about the meaning behind our attachment to mementos of our past. Wait a minute, did you just see that? What the fuck? We later see a similar episode in the following season, entitled The Curse of Reptar. Stu ends up making bank on a new invention and decides to spend that money on a pool. And in the middle of the process, the construction crew comes across the kid's long-lost reptar toy. They only take a few moments with it to reminisce about the good times that they once shared, only to throw it away in the trash immediately after, as it has definitely seen better days. But upon throwing him away, things around the house start to go wrong in a very poltergeist esque sort of way, <laughs> leading them to be convinced that they have disrespected the spirit of Reptar by casting him aside without any remorse. It's later debunked in the episode that the reason as to why the house has been behaving in such unsettling ways was due to structural damage that was done by the pool construction crew. But after they spent all this time considering just how much Reptar once meant to them, Tommy decides to rescue Reptar from what was considered his final resting place. I'll even throw a few points to Chucky here, in that he is is the biggest advocate for saving Reptar throughout the entire episode. The first movie we saw was Reptar. He was our first cereal, our first snack bar. 
our first ice show was Reptar on Ice. Reptar even gave me a mom and a sister. If we hadn't gone to Reptar Land, my dad wouldn't have met Kira and Kimmy. It's extremely endearing, and while it may come across as cheap on my part to say that these two episodes with extremely similar themes represent what I believe the heart of All Grown Up to be, allow me to elaborate by pointing out the biggest blunders that the series committed during its time. <laughs> The biggest issue that plagues All Grown Up is that above all else, it did not want to be the same show as Rugrats. And there isn't anything inherently wrong with that sentiment. But the interesting thing that I found with All Grown Up is that while it is a show that is meant to represent the realities of being an adolescent, it feels as though it's still scared to present those realities to its audience in a way that carries truth. If anything, I think that my biggest takeaway from revisiting All Grown Up is that it isn't a truthful show to begin with. It tries so hard to paint us this picture of angst and young rebellion, but none of it feels believable to me. Rugrats, while fantastical, was always rooted in reality to some degree. Even when it was at its wackiest, the world in which they lived in felt believable. Most of the time, anyways. <laughs> When I watch All Grown Up, I just get this feeling of inauthenticity or artificiality when I see the way in which their world works. I touched upon this at the start of my character analysis section, mostly in relation to Tommy's talent for filmmaking, but to expand a bit more, one of the biggest issues of this show is that in terms of maturity, they present these kids in a fashion that is just old enough to where their actual ages don't feel right to me. And to harken back again to something that I said previously, it's most noticeable at the school that they all attend. If Dill is 9 years old and the youngest and Angelica just turned 13 at the end of season 1 and is the oldest, why is this public middle school facilitating such a wide group of kids that are honestly at completely different levels of childhood maturity? Thinking of just how a brain develops, that age gap is a really significant one, which is why middle schools exist in the first place, to provide a more gradual and appropriate transition for students between elementary school and high school. But since all of the kids are here, there is a clear lack of age identity among all all of them. And in some ways, this feels intentional, allowing the writers to make up whatever stories they feel like writing, even if they are unrealistic for characters their age. And before you finish typing that comment, yes, I am aware that I am searching for realism in a cartoon that is a sequel series to another cartoon about a bunch of talking babies. But allow me to just say my piece here. This just isn't how preteens, adolescents, tweens, whatever the hell you want to call them, are. Not just in terms of how intelligent they are, or how much independence they are granted, but but also in the way in which they speak, especially when you consider the time period in which the show aired. Mature at work here? Mongo Importanto? Who knows what effect the cross the fame border has on sibling symbiosis? What's the haps? It's defamation of character! What a bum rap. <laughs> Wait, wah. Knack that! Yo, Dill, you and Izzy wanna swing it to my place for some foodstuffs? Isn't Z some rock star? Does that be hoodlum? Yeah, this is some rockin' gingerbread. Aren't we all in a cage right now? Cages of consumerism. Your ex for my text. This place is tight and out of sight. I don't know. History is so passe. Sip it. Don't drip it. I'm digging on this garden scene. Because you know it's against the rules to mac on your best friend's sister. It's just a metaphor for the alienation we all feel. It all comes across as this out-of-touch perception of what the writers believed teenagers to be in the early 2000s. And yes, I did say teenagers because that's what I feel like they wanted to write these characters as. They didn't want to be stuck with writing about kids still, even though they had no choice. So they mentally aged up the characters in an attempt to be as hip and trendy as possible for the sake of getting viewer engagement, resulting in an extremely inaccurate depiction of what it means to be a preteen. You could make the argument that All Grown Up never promised to be an accurate interpretation of the preteen experience, but in taking this direction, All Grown Up goes against what I believe is the core theme of what they are trying to represent here, which is that growing up is difficult for everyone, and in different ways too. Even if you're between the ages of 10 and 13, it can be difficult, but the struggles that they are facing here simply aren't believable for the ages that they are all at. And while sure, you can sacrifice realism for the sake of entertainment value here and there, but if you genuinely wanted to create a show that your audience could connect with, teaching them valuable lessons so that they could feel more prepared for when life hits them with their own versions of these challenges, then maybe you shouldn't have made the show about kids growing up being about kids that feel like they already have. I mentioned 
mentioned how the heart of All Grown Up was always most clear in the ways they'd pay homage to the past. Even if it was based in nostalgia, it was still given to us through a more mature lens. There was a palpable tenderness to these moments, and you could tell that the kids do yearn for the past in some ways. But due to the rebellious nature that this show has committed to, it's almost like the kids aren't allowed to take those moments of self-reflection as often as they should. That they aren't allowed to ask their parents or teachers for help when they truly need it. That they might actually have more restrictions on how they need to be than the show might let on. Like I said, tween age independence, at least to the level on display in this show, isn't a thing. Even the pilot makes all of this abundantly clear to us from the start. But since the once age-locked infants have now been age-locked yet again, how else were they supposed to be a more mature show other than drastically embellishing the preteen experience? It's a decision that had to be made, but it ultimately led to a series that has aged worse than its own characters. And that truly makes me sad, as I wanted it to stand the test of time. Maybe if the 10 year time skip wasn't so important, we could have gotten a more honest show, simply by making them real teenagers instead. Or better yet, have them grow up as the show goes on, allowing us to see them come into their own a bit more as they become, well, another year older, another year wiser. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever get that though, nor do I really believe that we need it at this point. All Grown Up deserves to fade into obscurity, as it pales in comparison to not just Rugrats, but another show made by Klasky Chupo that not only attempted to do the same things that All Grown Up did, but actually did it a whole lot better. Yeah, believe it or not, the show as told by Ginger, which was also produced by Klasky Chupo, does everything right that I believe All Grown Up did wrong, to the point where it is actually kind of astounding. So astounding, in fact, that I'm going to save my thoughts on As Told by Ginger for a part 2 to this video. I was originally going to share my thoughts on both of these shows in the same video, however I struggled for much longer than I'd like to admit in my attempts to combine it all into one script. So you'll be getting another in-depth video about that series in the near future. Anyways, I want to thank you so much for watching this video. To even think that I completed this feels unbelievable. If you enjoyed this video, then I would very much appreciate it if you could give it a like, and if you want to see more content from me, then feel free to subscribe to my channel as well. I am also streaming on Twitch nowadays, which has been a lot of fun getting to connect with viewers and also just play some really fun games. I really enjoy games that are based on cartoons, like for example I've streamed South Park Stick of Truth, Simpsons Hit and Run, and Scooby-Doo Night of a Hundred Frights, and I have more planned as well. I'm going through a bit of a rebrand over there, just as a heads up, like I plan on doing some retro commercial watch party streams every now and again, and I'm also planning on getting into some RPGs that I have put off for years. Wow. If any of that sounds of interest to you, then I'd also love it if you could head on over there to twitch.tv slash Kim Hennings and give me a follow. Hope to see you there. And I think that's all I've got for now, everybody. Thank you again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again for both part two as well as other videos to come. Bye.